You're watching ETN, where we don't do news, we just talk entertainment. Share and subscribe. And now, straight out of Boston, Massachusetts, it's time for Entertainment Talk Nation, your number one entertainment talk show, discussing everything from the movies to video games and more. All right. And now, here is your host. Here we go, Robert baby. Rosado. Good evening, good evening. Happy Labor Day. Happy Monday night. Welcome to the ETN Podcast. We are live on YouTube, Twitch, Mixer, and DLive. But of course, a good portion of our crowd right now is from YouTube. We hope to change that as time progresses. Now, a couple of topics to discuss tonight. First of all, if you're new here, if you've never seen me before, make sure to come visit YouTube. The link is in the bottom panel on Twitch, Mixer as well as DLive, you can click the YouTube link and subscribe to the channel. Also, if you want to follow me on social media platforms, you can follow me on these particular platforms above, Instagram, Twitter, and, excuse me, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. I had it right. I thought I said Twitch. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple of things tonight, and then what we like to do here on the ETN Podcast is after we talk about some of these entertainment-related topics, we take it to chat where we interact for the rest of the live stream. All alerts and notifications are off during this portion of the live stream. So if you want to make a donation or if you want to say something out in the open, you might want to reserve that for the end of this portion of the live stream. So tonight we begin in the world of wrestling where it's getting very interesting as we begin to count down to AEW's Wednesday night debut. And they had a pay-per-view this past weekend. And, you know, I've talked a little bit about wrestling on the channel but I have a hard time sometimes watching the program itself, in particular Raw, because it's three hours long. I used to review them, and I decided I'm just going to strictly review the pay-per-views. Yes, I'm going to review the pay-per-views, and we're going to do a short, short review of AEW. It's a very long uh, pay-per-view, and I just kind of want to go through it, some of the key matches. I'm not going to go through every match, but I will say overall it was a good pay-per-view. I feel AEW's produ production value still needs a lot of work. There were some areas of the um, show where it was very, you just didn't get great angles. Uh, in particular, the Casino Royale, the ladies' Casino Royale in the beginning had that issue. Uh, also, they really, really need to extend the barrier area around the ring. There's not enough room to do those high-flying moves with those barriers so close to the ring. They really need to change that or somebody's going to get hurt. However, I would say the match of the night was the Young Bucks and the Lucha Brothers. Uh, just fantastic. Now, to be fair, there was some criticism out there saying that it looked very, very uh, choreographed. You know, obviously they might have worked together sometime before the pay-per-view and there were certain spots that they rehearsed. I don't have a problem with that. If when it comes to matches like ladder matches and these kind of matches where you're going to go out there and you're going to start diving and putting your body on the line, uh, I think rehearsing is fine if it means that you're going to be safer. Because at the end of the day, you're still putting on a performance for people, okay? And look, we're all adults, you know what I mean? Yes, maybe, obviously children may not know better, but we're all adults. We know that these guys are putting their body on the line for our entertainment. I do not, if they rehearse a couple of spots... So that way they make sure they do it safe. That's fine. With that said, one of the Young Bucks took a nasty dive off the top rope. When he was pushed from a ladder, he bounced off the top rope and fell like headfirst into a table. And it was the fact that he was able to walk away from that is incredible. But th those are the things that I think AEW needs to kind of improve upon. We can give WWE all the criticism in the world. But if nothing else, a lot of their matches are very crisp. They're very you know, what I'm trying to say, like, they just don't, obviously they don't take the chances the independents do or the a or AEW does, but there's good reason for that. You know, they still have a show to put on. These guys, they are athletes, they are acrobats, but I really feel like they need to kind of be a little bit more careful with some of their spots because, man, I don't know how how he survived that, but nonetheless, it was a fantastic match. Kenny Omega and Pac, also formerly known as Neville to some of you WWE fans, I thought that was a good match. Now they're pushing the storyline with Kenny Omega being the, the the going on a losing streak, being in a slump, so to speak. 
And a lot of people are behind the storyline. I particularly, I think it's a good storyline. In my opinion, I think it's a, just something they might want to wait for. You're going into your, your TV shows now. You got your pay-per-views up. You guys are riding a little bit of momentum. And you're taking your, your probably one of your biggest names outside of Jericho, the Young Bucks, and obviously Cody and a couple of others. You're taking your biggest name or one of your biggest names and you're, you're having him put over uh, you know, not that Pac is a bad wrestler to put over, but still, I, I kind of think Pac needs a couple of rivalries with somebody else before, in my opinion, he's up on Kenny Omega's level. Nonetheless, it was a good match. These guys sold it really well. I mean, there were some spots that even me, I couldn't tell, man, was that intentional? Was there an accident there? But these guys put on a great show. Uh, I do like the storyline with Kenny Omega. I think it's just something they should have put down a little further down the road. I think going into your big debut and everything like that, I think give the fans what they want because the fans were not happy that he lost this match. And a lot of people weren't too happy at what happened with his last match that he lost as well. So we'll see where that goes. I still think oh, Kenny Omega obviously is in a good spot. Cody Rhodes and Sean, uh, Sean Spears. Uh, it was a pretty okay match. I wanted to see more wrestling, less interference. Uh, it was all right. I, I I think Sean Spears should have won that match. I think Sean, they could have really set up Sean Spears to be one of the better heels going into their early TV platform and, and to the TV shows. So I don't think it was a good choice to have him lose. That's my opinion. Uh, Sean Spears, I think, is he's a good, he's a big guy. He's a very talented wrestler, very athletic. And he got so much heat after what happened at the last pay-per-view when hitting Cody Rhodes over the head that I think you would have just elevated that heat if you had him uh, win the match. And you could have done it in a sly way where it wasn't necessarily legal if you want to go that route. Sometimes that generates more heat. But nonetheless, Cody won. Uh, hopefully they build up upon Sean Spears a little bit more. And then we go from there. Now, the Chris Jericho Hangman Page match, a uh, little bit too predictable. Uh, there was no other wrestler in there. Uh, you know, if, if you had Jericho going up against Kenny Omega, it wouldn't have been as predictable. If you had Jericho going up against, like, Cody Rhodes, or, it wouldn't have been so predictable. Hangman Page is a great, great wrestler. He's very talented, but he's not quite there in terms of recognition. There was no way they were going to have Hangman Page win this match. And because the match was so predictable, I wasn't a big fan in fact there were certain points i wasn't even paying that much attention the wrestling was good you know but the storyline was very subpar and because it was so predictable i i didn't like it very much i gotta be honest and then finally the big thing that everybody was expecting was a cm punk reveal or a cm punk showing up now i'm gonna close this segment of the podcast by saying this I understand people love CM Punk. I get it. I get it. Now, I wasn't watching wrestling when CM Punk was around. I watched wrestling up until Chris Benoit committed suicide and killed his family. And at that point, I was so devastated. I stopped watching wrestling for a long time. And I came back to watching wrestling in 2015. So it was a good almost 10 years or so before I got back into wrestling. During that time, by the time I came back, CM Punk was already gone. You know, now I've gone back and I've watched the pipe bomb and I've watched all his big matches. And but here's the thing. I cannot believe that this is still going on for so many years. CM Punk. Look, I'm going to say it. I'm going to be honest. OK, after what I've seen, CM Punk is OK. He's not the greatest wrestler in the world. He's great on the mic. And when you think about it. All the greatest wrestlers that people love are not necessarily great wrestlers. They're just great on the mic. I mean, Hulk Hogan, you know, great on the mic. Can anyone sit here and say he's a good wrestler? No. The Rock, athletic, great on the mic, wasn't exactly doing the most technical moves in any of his matches. Stone Cold Steve Austin, great on the mic, not exactly a technical prowess. Was all punches and kicks and Stone Cold Stunners and beers and middle fingers. Sam Punk, better technically than those guys, but not as sound a technical wrestler as, say, someone like Bret Hart or, you know, uh, Davey Boy Smith or Chris Benoit in his prime or even Eddie Guerrero. But definitely better. But he was great on the mic. So I think people need to get over CM Punk, let him be, 
And if I'm to make a prediction, if CM Punk does return and he goes to AEW, he wasn't going to debut on that pay-per-view anyway. He was going to debut on a TV show. So if you have one last hope for CM Punk, watch AEW that Wednesday night. Because if he is coming to AEW, that's the night he's going to premiere. Why? Because if you're going to start your TV show, you start it with a bang. And that's how you get people to watch your show. Okay, we'll go from there. Now, moving on. Godzilla versus Kong. Movie coming out next year in March. One of the most common questions I get during any live stream or any of my videos or any of the case, any of the case may be, is when are we getting a Godzilla versus Kong trailer? And I'm here to make my prediction. I feel we will be getting Godzilla versus Kong trailer the Tuesday of the week that the Joker comes out. Here's why. That's also around the time. I'm guessing the end of the month, but you know, we'll we'll see. A lot of people think. It might be with the Joker. It might very well be the, with the Joker. But actually, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say by the end of this month. New York City Comic Con releases, or, or excuse me, starts the first week of October going into the weekend. That is the key date that I felt that we would see the trailer because Warner Brothers did not have a presence at San Diego Comic Con. From that moment going forward, I felt, well, if that's the case, they're probably going to do it at New York Comic Con. Because New York Comic Con has been pushing really hard to become become the premier Comic Con in the country every year. And slowly and surely, they progressively have been uh, accomplishing that. If they were to sway for Warner Brothers to start showing a, a lot of their IPs at New York Comic Con with a panel there as opposed to San Diego, that's a big win for them. Now, something like Marvel will always be at both. Marvel's never going to pick one over the other. But having Warner Brothers going to New York Comic Con exclusively, I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying that's been reported. This is just a theory I have. Now, along with that, I would think that by then we would have to get the trailer. We have the movie coming out in March. By the time you get into October, you got October, November, December, January, February, March. That's five months. So I think New York City Comic Con, that week, going into New York City Comic Con, around that area, that first week, the last week of September, going into the first week of October, keep your eyes peeled. Godzilla vs. Kong trailer will drop. Either at Comic Con, either that earlier that week, maybe the week prior. But I'm betting it's going to be New York City Comic Con. We're going to get that trailer. And then, uh, then from there forward, you're going to see a ramp up in marketing. We'll get to learn more information. We'll get maybe to learn about Apex, you know, the new organization that we've seen listed. We'll get to learn about maybe some other of the Titans we might see pop up again, whether or not we'll see Mothra again, whether or not we'll see Rodan again. So going on with that, there was an article in Screen Rant today with a theory of Kong fighting Godzilla to become the new Alpha. Uh, I'll leave the link in now. This is going to scare everybody because it's going to pop up all over the place and it's going to pop up four times because I'm not using one chat. I have a dedicated chat that is for all platforms. So brace yourself. So this article from Screen Rant will uh, the theory that this gentleman is giving is that he believes Kong is fighting Godzilla for the alpha title. I don't think that's the case. If you've read the novelization of the movie, if you pay attention to some of the smaller details, Kong really doesn't want to get involved in that. Kong has no desire to fight. He's got no desire to submit to anybody, and he's got no desire to be boss anywhere in the world other than his domain. So, interesting theory, but I think it's lacking in some of the areas that you should probably read before you do a theory like that the bottom line is the fight is going to break out because kong is going to be insulted for lack of a better term that godzilla is going to step on his land and we all know that godzilla is going not going down there all the titans are converging on skull island because there are there's something going on underneath skull island skull island seems to be the hub for the hollow earth theory you know, that's where uh, Dr. Brooks first discovered it. And then we learn in Godzilla, King of the Monsters, that there are different portals, like, you know, portals, I'm putting quotations here. There are different portals that connect all different portions, all different portions of the Hollow Earth. And it seems like Kong Skull Island is the hub. So 
very interesting. But if you guys want to read the article, the link is in uh, the chat. Go ahead and check it out. Give me your thoughts on it at some point, whether you want to do it when we go to chat in a little bit, or if you want to leave it on one of the comments in my video. So now moving on to Dave Chappelle. Now, Dave Chappelle had a Netflix comedy, stand-up comedy uh, come out in last, I think it was late last week, middle of last week. And I saw it, okay? I, I, I actually resubscribed from Netflix just to watch this because of all the buzz it was getting. Now, it hasn't been getting good buzz, okay? There seems to be a great deal of people offended by this uh, stand-up comedy performance. And I got to be honest, I watched it. It is one of the funniest stand-up comedy uh, routines I've seen since George Carlin. It is extraordinarily offensive. And there was either even one segment that he did that I was like, whoa. Um, that, but that was the only part of the show I didn't like. You know, you guys know I have kids. I don't really, I'm not into pedophilia jokes. I think those are just certain things you should not touch. Uh, so a lot of you guys know how I felt about what, what when James Gunn and all his old pedophilia jokes and pictures came out. I was not cool with that. You know, never thought he should lose his job or anything. But I definitely lost a lot of respect for the man. Uh, Dave Chappelle's wasn't as offensive, or if you want to call it, because I'm not, I'm not usually easily offended. Like I said, I just think pedophilia jokes are should be, you know, that's should one area you shouldn't mess with. But Dave Chappelle's weren't nearly as bad as James Gunn, but they were pretty bad. But outside of that, the stand-up comedy was just fantastic. I mean, he's using words that some of us, because of the way the culture is now, don't feel comfortable saying. Like, he was saying faggot, you know what I mean? Which I thought was hilarious. He was he was getting on everybody. He wasn't taking sides. He wasn't taking any sides. He ripped everyone up and down. It was so funny. And what do you think about the reviews? Well, if you go on YouTube and you watch some of the clips, some of the highlights from the stand-up comedy, you'll notice that there is a fantastic... There is a fantastic like to dislike ratio in favor of likes. I mean, I think one of his clips where he was talking about the Justin Smollett case, uh, for those of you who don't know, that's the gentleman who lied about getting attacked by Trump supporters in Chicago one late night. Well, he did a routine on that, which was just hilarious. And the highlight is on YouTube. And I think it's got like 112,000 upvotes versus like 3,000 downvotes. And... You look at Rotten Tomatoes, and suddenly there is five total reviews, all rotten. And there's a reason for this. <laughs> there's a reason for this. You know, one of the reasons why comedy is not that great anymore is because people are very scared, with the exception of very few. Uh, obviously, Dave Chappelle, Kevin Hart, but Kevin Hart's not nearly as raw as Dave Chappelle. Uh, he's just very funny in his antics and his, some of his physical comedy is really good. He got five reviews, all rotten. Now, I feel it's safe to say that there are people who don't who who love this comedy stand up, but they not they're not going to come out and say it. And then, of course, there are people who are offended. Bottom line is, we need more comedy like this. We need more comedy like this. We need it all the time. We need people to be more like the comedy of old. You know, the Richard Pryors, the Eddie Murphys, the, the George Carlins of those years. Now Dave Chappelle. Chris Rock in his heyday was hilarious. But now we don't get that because people are, you know, they're, they're you know, pussyfooting around certain topics because they don't want to lose their followers on Twitter or they want to make sure, you know, all that kind of stuff. That social culture that is very, very soft very, very, uh, I would like to say most of which is intentionally offended. Uh, if you're, you know, if you're sincerely offended by something, then you don't watch it. Bottom line. So if you have a chance to check out Dave Chappelle's stand up on Netflix, I highly recommend it. It is so funny. You're going to, especially if you like old school, I'm, I, I can't even say old school, like comedy from like 10 years ago, you know, anywhere from 10 years ago, going back further, that comedy style, that raw, offensive comedy, go watch this, man. It is a classic. It is so, so good. 
So definitely. And then uh, we're going to end today. Not end the stream. We're going to go into chat after this. But we're going to end this this uh, podcast, this ETN podcast, with what I consider to be one of the stinkiest, most horrible bullshit articles I've read in my life. Attention, this is not a test. Do not nope. adjust your computer. This is an ETN bullshit alert. Yes, yeah, so today, or actually I should say three days ago, there was an article on Screen Rant that is pitching the idea of Miss Marvel, Kamala Khan, who is a character that's going to be getting her own show on Disney+. Plus. Yes, and then of course is going to be highlighted in the Captain Marvel movies going forward, starting with the sequel. This person, his name is Thomas Bacon. With a last name like that, you'd think the guy would be cool. You know, everybody loves Bacon. Kamala Khan is your new Spider-Man. Yes, she is the perfect replacement for Spider-Man, according to this uh, imbecile. Yes, and I will link this in chat for all platforms so you guys can read this yourself. Uh, because it's kind of hard to find on the website. You got to go like back like so many weeks, not not weeks, but they put so much bullshit articles up there that, you know, it's it's kind of hard to find whether or not <laughs> it's kind of hard to find it with pages and pages of shit. But in essence, basically what he's saying is that she is one of the most popular comic book characters equaling the popularity of Spider-Man. Look, I have not read comics in years, okay? I, I'm not, I, I'll admit, you know, after a while, you have to set your priorities in other areas. You know, you guys know I'm married. I have a family. I'm pretty sure her popularity as compared to Spider-Man is uh, none. Zero. Zilch. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not knocking the character. I've never read her comic. I can't say whether or not it's good or bad. But I feel safe to say that she is nowhere near a replacement for Spider-Man. Okay, when you got the X-Men coming and you got Fantastic Four coming, I very much doubt, even if Kevin Feige says it up front, I very much doubt you're going to build your MCU around Miss Marvel Kamala Khan. Now, this, this, uh, excuse me, journalist write so highly about Kamala Khan that I actually had to go and look up. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe she is that popular. Maybe her sales are through the roof. Maybe, you know, no, no, not even close. I did look up sales for her. Now, she debuted in 2013, but she be debuted her own series in 2014. So I went and looked at comic sales uh, from 2014 going forward, and I can honestly tell you that... Her debut comic was, I believe, 91. Ranked 91. You want to know who was in the top five that month? Spider-Man. And then I said, you know what? Let's let's just randomly go back a couple more years. And let's, let's see where she's at. 2017. Still being beat by Spider-Man in sales. So, you know, I mean, I get it. You know, I'm all about diversity. I'm all about making sure, uh, you know, everybody is represented, but they have to be represented in such a way where they earn it. Earn it, okay? Kamala Khan will never uh, wear... Will ne Kamala Khan can never sniff Spider-Man's jockstrap. Let's just put it that way, okay? Let's be honest here. Let's get down to brass tacks. Kamala Khan may be a great character. I've, again, I've never read the book. I've never read a comic, but I feel comfortable enough to say that Kamala Khan will never, ever stand up to Spider-Man. Will never reach that clout. She'll never reach that height. So that's the bullshit segment. It was a bullshit article by a bullshit journalist who has a great last name, Bacon. I mean, how could you go wrong with that? If you're born with the last name Bacon, you should be everybody's best friend. Honestly, but when you write shit like that, I can understand why nobody likes you. All right, we are done with the podcast portion of the live stream. 
we're going to take it to chat.